but a real love affair was an almost unthinkable event. The women of the party were all alike. Chastity was as deeply ingrained in them as party loyalty. By careful early conditioning, by games and cold water, by the rubbish that was dinned into them at school and in the spies and the youth league, by lectures, parades, songs, slogans, and martial music, the natural feeling had been driven out of them. His reason told him that there must be exceptions, but his heart did not believe it. They were all impregnable as the party intended that they should be. And what he wanted, more even than to be loved, was to break down that wall of virtue, even if it were only once in his whole life. The sexual act successfully performed was rebellion. Desire was thought crime. Even to have awakened Catherine, if he could have achieved it, would have been like a seduction, although she was his wife. But the rest of the story had got to be written down. He wrote, I turned up the lamp. When I saw her in the light, after the darkness, the feeble light of the paraffin lamp had seemed very bright. For the first time he could see the woman properly. He had taken a step toward her and then halted, full of lust and terror. He was painfully conscious of the risk he had taken in coming here. It was perfectly possible that the patrols would catch him on the way out. For that matter, they might be waiting outside the door at this moment. If he went away without even doing what he had come here to do, it had got to be written down, it had got to be confessed. What he had suddenly seen in the lamplight was that the woman was old. The paint was plastered so thick on her face that it looked as though it might crack like a cardboard mask. There were streaks of white in her hair, but the truly dreadful detail was that her mouth had fallen a little open, revealing nothing except a cavernous blackness. She had no teeth at all. He wrote hurriedly in scrabbling handwriting, When I saw her in the light, she was quite an old woman, fifty years old at least, but I went ahead and did it just the same. He pressed his fingers against his eyelids again. He had written it down at last, but it made no difference. The therapy had not worked. The urge to shout filthy words at the top of his voice was as strong as ever. Chapter 7 If there is hope, wrote Winston, it lies in the proles. If there was hope, it must lie in the proles, because only there, in those swarming, disregarded masses, 85% of the population of Oceania, could the force to destroy the party ever be generated. The party could not be overthrown from within. Its enemies, if it had any enemies, had no way of coming together or even of identifying one another. Even if the legendary Brotherhood existed, as just possibly it might, it was inconceivable that its members could ever assemble in larger numbers than twos and threes. Rebellion meant a look in the eyes, an inflection of the voice, at the most an occasional whispered word. But the proles, if only they could somehow become conscious of their own strength, would have no need to conspire. They needed only to rise up and shake themselves like a horse shaking off flies. If they chose, they could blow the party to pieces tomorrow morning. Surely, sooner or later, it must occur to them to do it. And yet, he remembered how once he had been walking down a crowded street when a tremendous shout of hundreds of voices, women's voices, had burst from a side street a little way ahead. It was a great, formidable cry of anger and despair, a deep, loud, ooh, that went humming on like the reverberation of a bell. His heart had leapt. It started, he had thought, a riot. The proles are breaking loose at last. When he had reached the spot, it was to see a mob of two or three hundred women crowding around the stalls of a street market, with faces as tragic as though they had been the doomed passengers on a sinking ship. But at this moment the general despair broke down into a multitude of individual quarrels. It appeared that one of the stalls had been selling tin saucepans. They were wretched, flimsy things, but cooking pots of any kind were always difficult to get. Now the supply had unexpectedly given out. The successful women, bumped and jostled by the rest, were trying to make off with their saucepans, while dozens of others clamored round the stall, accusing the stallkeeper of favoritism and of having more saucepans somewhere in reserve. There was a fresh outburst of yells. Two bloated women, one of them with her hair coming down, had got hold of the same saucepan and were trying to tear it out of one another's hands. For a moment they were both tugging, and then the handle came off. Winston watched them disgustedly. And yet... Just for a moment, what almost frightening power had sounded in that cry from only a few hundred throats? 
Why was it that they could never shout like that about anything that mattered? Until they become conscious, they will never rebel. And until after they have rebelled, they cannot become conscious. That, he reflected, might almost have been a transcription from one of the party textbooks. The party claimed, of course, to have liberated the proles from bondage. Before the revolution, they had been hideously oppressed by the capitalists. They had been starved and flogged. Women had been forced to work in the coal mines. Women still did work in the coal mines, as a matter of fact. Children had been sold into the factories at the age of six. But simultaneously, true to the principles of doublethink, the party taught that the proles were natural inferiors who must be kept in subjection, like animals, by the application of a few simple rules. In reality, very little was known about the proles. It was not necessary to know much. So long as they continued to work and breed, their other activities were without importance. Left to themselves like cattle turned loose upon the plains of Argentina, they had reverted to a style of life that appeared to be natural to them, a sort of ancestral pattern. They were born, they grew up in the gutters, they went to work at twelve, they passed through a brief blossoming period of beauty and sexual desire. They married at twenty, they were middle-aged at thirty, they died for the most part at sixty. Heavy physical work, the care of home and children, petty quarrels with neighbors, films, football, beer, and above all, gambling, filled up the horizon of their minds. To keep them in control was not difficult. This ends side one of cassette two. Please turn the cassette over and start side two from the same point. A few agents of the thought police moved always among them, spreading false rumors and marking down and eliminating the few individuals who were judged capable of becoming dangerous. But no attempt was made to indoctrinate them with the ideology of the party. It was not desirable that the proles should have strong political feelings. All that was required of them was a primitive patriotism, which could be appealed to whenever it was necessary to make them accept longer working hours or shorter rations. And even when they became discontented, as they sometimes did, their discontent led nowhere, because being without general ideas, they could only focus it on petty, specific grievances. The larger evils invariably escaped their notice. The great majority of proles did not even have telescreens in their homes. Even the civil police interfered with them very little. There was a vast amount of criminality in London, a whole world within a world of thieves, bandits, prostitutes, drug peddlers, and racketeers of every description. But since it all happened among the proles themselves, it was of no importance. In all questions of morals, they were allowed to follow their ancestral code. The sexual puritanism of the party was not imposed upon them. Promiscuity went unpunished. Divorce was permitted. For that matter, even religious worship would have been permitted if the proles had shown any sign of needing or wanting it. They were beneath suspicion. As the party slogan put it, proles and animals are free. Winston reached down and cautiously scratched his varicose ulcer. It had begun itching again. The thing you invariably came back to was the impossibility of knowing what life before the revolution had really been like. He took out of the drawer a copy of a children's history textbook which he had borrowed from Mrs. Parsons and began copying a passage into the diary. In the old days, it ran, before the glorious revolution, London was not the beautiful city that we know today. It was a dark, dirty, miserable place where hardly anybody had enough to eat and where hundreds and thousands of poor people had no boots on their feet and not even a roof to sleep under. Children no older than you are had to work twelve hours a day for cruel masters who flogged them with whips if they worked too slowly and fed them on nothing but stale bread crusts and water. But in among this terrible poverty there were just a few great, big, beautiful houses that were lived in by rich men who had as many as thirty servants to look after them. These rich men were called capitalists. They were fat, ugly men with wicked faces like the one in the picture on the opposite page. You can see that he is dressed in a long black coat, which was called a frock coat, and a queer, shiny hat shaped like a stovepipe, which was called a top hat. This was the uniform of the capitalists, and no one else was allowed to wear it. The capitalists owned everything in the world, and everyone else was their slave. They owned all the land, all the houses, all the factories, and all the money. If anyone disobeyed them, they could throw him into prison, or they could take his job away and starve him to death. When any ordinary person spoke to a capitalist, he had to cringe and bow to him and take off his cap and address him as Sir. The chief of all the capitalists was called the king, and 
But he knew the rest of the catalogue. There would be mention of the bishops in their lawn sleeves, the judges in their ermine robes, the pillory, the stocks, the treadmill, the cat o' nine tails, the Lord Mayor's banquet, and the practice of kissing the Pope's toe. There was also something called the Jus Prime Noctis, which would probably not be mentioned in a textbook for children. It was the law by which every capitalist had the right to sleep with any woman working in one of his factories. How could you tell how much of it was lies? It might be true that the average human being was better off now than he had been before the revolution. The only evidence to the contrary was the mute protest in your own bones, the instinctive feeling that the conditions you lived in were intolerable and that at some other time they must have been different. It struck him that the truly characteristic thing about modern life was not its cruelty and insecurity, but simply its bareness, its dinginess, its listlessness. Life, if you looked about you, bore no resemblance not only to the lies that streamed out of the telescreens, but even to the ideals that the party was trying to achieve. Great areas of it, even for a party member, were neutral and non-political, a matter of slogging through dreary jobs, fighting for a place on the tube, darning a worn-out sock, cadging a saccharine tablet, saving a cigarette end. The ideal set up by the party was something huge, terrible, and glittering. A world of steel and concrete, of monstrous machines and terrifying weapons. A nation of warriors and fanatics marching forward in perfect unity, all thinking the same thoughts and shouting the same slogans, perpetually working, fighting, triumphing, persecuting, three hundred million people all with the same face. The reality was decaying, dingy cities where underfed people shuffled to and fro in leaky shoes, in patched-up nineteenth-century houses that smelt always of cabbage and bad lavatories. He seemed to see a vision of London, vast and ruinous, city of a million dustbins, and mixed up with it was a picture of Mrs. Parsons, a woman with lined face and wispy hair, fiddling helplessly with a blocked waste-pipe. He reached down and scratched his ankle again. Day and night the telescreens bruised your ears with statistics proving that people today had more food, more clothes, better houses, better recreations, that they lived longer, worked shorter hours, were bigger, healthier, stronger, happier, more intelligent, better educated than the people of fifty years ago. Not a word of it could ever be proved or disproved. The party claimed, for example, that today forty percent of adult proles were literate. Before the revolution, it was said, the number had only been fifteen percent. The party claimed that the infant mortality rate was now only a hundred and sixty per thousand, whereas before the revolution it had been three hundred. And so it went on. It was like a single equation with two unknowns. It might very well be that literally every word in the history books, even the things that one accepted without question, was pure fantasy. For all he knew, there might never have been any such law as the Jus Prime Noctis, or any such creature as a capitalist, or any such garment as a top hat. Everything faded into mist. The past was erased, the erasure was forgotten, the lie became truth. Just once in his life he had possessed, after the event, that was what counted, concrete, unmistakable evidence of an act of falsification. He had held it between his fingers for as long as thirty seconds. In 1973, it must have been, at any rate it was at about the time when he and Catherine had parted, but the really relevant date was seven or eight years earlier. The story really began in the middle sixties, the period of the great purges in which the original leaders of the revolution were wiped out once and for all. By 1970, none of them was left except Big Brother himself. All the rest had by that time been exposed as traitors and counter-revolutionaries. Goldstein had fled and was hiding, no one knew where, and of the others, a few had simply disappeared, while the majority had been executed after spectacular public trials at which they had made confession of their crimes. Among the last survivors were three men named Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford. It must have been in 1965 that these three had been arrested. As often happened, they had vanished for a year or more, so that one did not know whether they were alive or dead, and then had suddenly been brought forth to incriminate themselves in the usual way. They had confessed to intelligence with the enemy at that date, too. The enemy was Eurasia, embezzlement of public funds, the murder of various trusted party members, intrigues against the leadership of Big Brother, which had started long before the revolution happened, and acts of sabotage causing the death of hundreds of thousands of people. 
After confessing to these things, they had been pardoned, reinstated in the party, and given posts, which were in fact sinecures, but which sounded important. All three had written long, abject articles in the Times, analyzing the reasons for their defection and promising to make amends. Some time after their release, Winston had actually seen all three of them in the Chestnut Tree Café. He remembered the sort of terrified fascination with which he had watched them out of the corner of his eye. They were men far older than himself, relics of the ancient world, almost the last great figures left over from the heroic early days of the party. The glamour of the underground struggle and the Civil War still faintly clung to them. He had the feeling, though already at that time facts and dates were growing blurry, that he had known their names earlier than he had known that of Big Brother. But also they were outlaws, enemies, untouchables, doomed with absolute certainty to extinction within a year or two. No one who had once fallen into the hands of the Thought Police ever escaped in the end. They were corpses waiting to be sent back to the grave. There was no one at any of the tables nearest to them. It was not wise even to be seen in the neighborhood of such people. They were sitting in silence before glasses of the gin flavored with cloves, which was the specialty of the café. Of the three, it was Rutherford whose appearance had most impressed Winston. Rutherford had once been a famous caricaturist, whose brutal cartoons had helped to inflame popular opinion before and during the Revolution. Even now, at long intervals, his cartoons were appearing in the Times. They were simply an imitation of his earlier manner, and curiously lifeless and unconvincing. Always they were a rehashing of the ancient themes, slum tenements, starving children, street battles, capitalists and top hats. Even on the barricades, the capitalists still seemed to cling to their top hats, an endless, hopeless effort to get back into the past. He was a monstrous man, with a mane of greasy gray hair, his face pouched and seamed with protuberant lips. At one time he must have been immensely strong. Now his great body was sagging, sloping, bulging, falling away in every direction. He seemed to be breaking up before one's eyes, like a mountain crumbling. It was the lonely hour of fifteen. Winston could not now remember how he had come to be in the café at such a time. The place was almost empty. A tinny music was trickling from the telescreens. The three men sat in their corner, almost motionless, never speaking. Uncommanded, the waiter brought fresh glasses of gin. There was a chessboard on the table beside them with the pieces set out, but no game started. And then, for perhaps half a minute in all, something happened to the telescreens. The tune that they were playing changed, and the tone of the music changed too. There came into it, but it was something hard to describe. It was a peculiar, cracked, braying, jeering note. In his mind, Winston called it a yellow note. And then a voice from the telescreen was singing... Under the spreading chestnut tree, I sold you and you sold me. There lie they and here lie we, under the spreading chestnut tree. The three men never stirred. But when Winston glanced again at Rutherford's ruinous face, he saw that his eyes were full of tears. And for the first time he noticed with a kind of inward shudder, and yet not knowing at what he shuddered, that both Aronson and Rutherford had broken noses. A little later, all three were rearrested. It appeared that they had engaged in fresh conspiracies from the very moment of their release. At their second trial, they confessed to all their old crimes over again with a whole string of new ones. They were executed, and their fate was recorded in the party histories, a warning to posterity. About five years after this, in 1973, Winston was unrolling a wad of documents which had just flopped out of the pneumatic tube onto his desk when he came on a fragment of paper which had evidently been slipped in among the others and then forgotten. The instant he had flattened it out, he saw its significance. It was a half page torn out of the Times of about ten years earlier, the top half of the page, so that it included the date, and it contained a photograph of the delegates at some party function in New York. Prominent in the middle of the group were Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford. There was no mistaking them. In any case, their names were in the caption at the bottom. The point was that at both trials, all three men had confessed that on that date they had been on Eurasian soil. 
They had flown from a secret airfield in Canada to a rendezvous somewhere in Siberia, and had conferred with members of the Eurasian General Staff, to whom they had betrayed important military secrets. The date had stuck in Winston's memory because it chanced to be Midsummer Day. But the whole story must be on record in countless other places as well. There was only one possible conclusion. The confessions were lies. Of course, this was not in itself a discovery. Even at that time, Winston had not imagined that the people who were wiped out in the purges had actually committed the crimes that they were accused of. But this was concrete evidence. It was a fragment of the abolished past, like a fossil bone which turns up in the wrong stratum and destroys a geological theory. It was enough to blow the party to atoms if in some way it could have been published to the world and its significance made known. He had gone straight on working. As soon as he saw what the photograph was and what it meant, he had covered it up with another sheet of paper. Luckily, when he unrolled it, it had been upside down from the point of view of the telescreen. He took his scribbling pad on his knee and pushed back his chair so as to get as far away from the telescreen as possible. To keep your face expressionless was not difficult, and even your breathing could be controlled with an effort. But you could not control the beating of your heart, and the telescreen was quite delicate enough to pick it up. He let what he judged to be ten minutes go by, tormented all the while by the fear that some accident, a sudden draft blowing across his desk, for instance, would betray him. Then, without uncovering it again, he dropped the photograph into the memory hole, along with some other waste papers. Within another minute, perhaps, it would have crumbled into ashes. That was ten, eleven years ago. Today, probably, he would have kept that photograph. It was curious that the fact of having held it in his fingers seemed to him to make a difference, even now, when the photograph itself, as well as the event it recorded, was only memory. Was the party's hold upon the past less strong, he wondered, because a piece of evidence which existed no longer had once existed? But today, supposing that it could be somehow resurrected from its ashes, the photograph might not even be evidence. Already, at the time when he made his discovery, Oceania was no longer at war with Eurasia, and it must have been to the agents of Eurasia that the three dead men had betrayed their country. Since then, there had been other changes. Two, three, he could not remember how many. Very likely, the confessions had been rewritten and rewritten until the original facts and dates no longer had the smallest significance. The past not only changed, but changed continuously. What most afflicted him with the sense of nightmare was that he had never clearly understood why the huge imposture was undertaken. The immediate advantages of falsifying the past were obvious, but the ultimate motive was mysterious. He took up his pen again and wrote, I understand how. I do not understand why. He wondered, as he had many times wondered before, whether he himself was a lunatic. Perhaps a lunatic was simply a minority of one. At one time it had been a sign of madness to believe that the earth goes round the sun, today to believe that the past is unalterable. He might be alone in holding that belief, and if alone, then a lunatic. But the thought of being a lunatic did not greatly trouble him. The horror was that he might also be wrong. He picked up the children's history book and looked at the portrait of Big Brother, which formed its frontispiece. The hypnotic eyes gazed into his own. It was as though some huge force were pressing down upon you, something that penetrated inside your skull, battering against your brain, frightening you out of your beliefs, persuading you almost to deny the evidence of your senses. In the end, the party would announce that two and two made five, and you would have to believe it. It was inevitable that they should make that claim sooner or later. The logic of their position demanded it. Not merely the validity of experience, but the very existence of external reality was tacitly denied by their philosophy. The heresy of heresies was common sense. And what was terrifying was not that they would kill you for thinking otherwise, but that they might be right. For after all, how do we know that two and two make four? or that the force of gravity works, or that the past is unchangeable. If both the past and the external world exist only in the mind, and if the mind itself is controllable, what then? But no, 
His courage seemed suddenly to stiffen of its own accord. The face of O'Brien, not called up by any obvious association, had floated into his mind. He knew with more certainty than before that O'Brien was on his side. He was writing the diary for O'Brien, to O'Brien. It was like an interminable letter which no one would ever read, but which was addressed to a particular person and took its color from that fact. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. His heart sank as he thought of the enormous power arrayed against him. The ease with which any party intellectual would overthrow him in debate, the subtle arguments which he would not be able to understand, much less answer. And yet he was in the right. They were wrong and he was right. The obvious, the silly and the true had got to be defended. Truisms are true. Hold on to that. The solid world exists. Its laws do not change. Stones are hard. Water is wet. Objects unsupported fall toward the earth's center with the feeling that he was speaking to O'Brien and also that he was setting forth an important axiom he wrote freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four if that is granted all else follows chapter eight from somewhere at the bottom of a passage, the smell of roasting coffee, real coffee, not victory coffee, came floating out into the street. Winston paused involuntarily. For perhaps two seconds he was back in the half-forgotten world of his childhood. Then a door banged, seeming to cut off the smell as abruptly as though it had been a sound. He had walked several kilometers over pavements, and his varicose also was throbbing. This was the second time in three weeks that he had missed an evening at the community center, a rash act, since you could be certain that the number of your attendances at the center were carefully checked. In principle, a party member had no spare time and was never alone except in bed. It was assumed that when he was not working, eating, or sleeping, he would be taking part in some kind of communal recreations. To do anything that suggested a taste for solitude, even to go for a walk by yourself, was always slightly dangerous. There was a word for it in you speak. Own life, it was called, meaning individualism and eccentricity. But this evening, as he came out of the ministry, the balminess of the April air had tempted him. The sky was a warmer blue than he had seen in that year. And suddenly the long, noisy evening at the center, the boring, exhausting games, the lectures, the creaking camaraderie oiled by gin had seemed intolerable. On impulse he had turned away from the bus stop and wandered off into the labyrinth of London, first south, then east, then north again, losing himself along unknown streets and hardly bothering in which direction he was going. If there is hope, he had written in the diary, it lies in the proles. The words kept coming back to him, statement of a mystical truth and a palpable absurdity. He was somewhere in the vague, brown-colored slums to the north and east of what had once been St. Pancras Station. He was walking up a cobbled street of little two-story houses with battered doorways which gave straight onto the pavement and which were somehow curiously suggestive of rat holes. There were puddles of filthy water here and there among the cobbles, in and out of the dark doorways and down narrow alleyways that branched off on either side, people swarmed in astonishing numbers, girls in full bloom with crudely lipstick mouths, and youths who chased the girls, and swollen, waddling women who showed you what the girls would be like in ten years' time, and old, bent creatures shuffling along on splayed feet, and ragged, barefooted children who played in puddles and then scattered at angry yells from their mothers. Perhaps a quarter of the windows in the street were broken and boarded up. Most of the people paid no attention to Winston. A few eyed him with a sort of guarded curiosity. Two monstrous women with brick-red forearms folded across their aprons were talking outside a doorway. Winston caught scraps of conversation as he approached. Yes, I says to her, that's all very well, I says. But if you'd been in my place, you'd have done the same as what I done. It's easy to criticize, I says. But you ain't got the same problems as what I got. Ah, says the other, that's just it. That's just where it is. The strident voices stopped abruptly. The women studied him in hostile silence as he went past. But it was not hostility, exactly. Merely a kind of wariness, a momentary stiffening as at the passing of some unfamiliar animal. 
The blue overalls of the party could not be a common sight in a street like this. Indeed, it was unwise to be seen in such places, unless you had definite business there. The patrols might stop you if you happened to run into them. May I see your papers, comrade? What are you doing here? What time did you leave work? Is this your usual way home? And so on and so forth. Not that there was any rule against walking home by an unusual route, but it was enough to draw attention to you if the thought police heard about it. Suddenly the whole street was in commotion. There were yells of warning from all sides. People were shooting into the doorways like rabbits. A young woman leapt out of a doorway a little ahead of Winston, grabbed up a tiny child playing in a puddle, whipped her apron about it, and leapt back again, all in one movement. At the same instant, a man in a concertina-like black suit who had emerged from a side alley ran toward Winston, pointing excitedly to the sky. Steamer, he yelled. Look out, governor. Bang overhead. Lay down quick. Steamer was a nickname which for some reason the proles applied to rocket bombs. Winston promptly flung himself on his face. The proles were nearly always right when they gave you a warning of this kind. They seemed to possess some kind of instinct which told them several seconds in advance when a rocket was coming, although the rocket supposedly traveled faster than sound. Winston clasped his forearms about his head. There was a roar that seemed to make the pavement heave. A shower of light objects pattered onto his back. When he stood up, he found that he was covered with fragments of glass from the nearest window. He walked on. The bomb had demolished a group of houses two hundred meters up the street. A black plume of smoke hung in the sky, and below it a cloud of plaster dust, in which a crowd was already forming round the ruins. There was a little pile of plaster lying on the pavement ahead of him, and in the middle of it he could see a bright red streak. When he got up to it, he saw that it was a human hand, severed at the wrist. Apart from the bloody stump, the hand was so completely whitened as to resemble a plaster cast. He kicked the thing into the gutter, and then, to avoid the crowd, turned down a side street to the right. Within three or four minutes he was out of the area which the bomb had affected, and the sordid, swarming life of the streets was going on as though nothing had happened. It was nearly twenty hours, and the drinking shops which the proles frequented, pubs they called them, were choked with customers. From their grimy swing doors, endlessly opening and shutting, there came forth a smell of urine, sawdust, and sour beer. In an angle formed by a projecting house front, three men were standing very close together, the middle one of them holding a folded-up newspaper which the other two were studying over his shoulders. Even before he was near enough to make out the expression on their faces, Winston could see absorption in every line of their bodies. It was obviously some serious piece of news that they were reading. He was a few paces away from them when suddenly the group broke up and two of the men were in a violent altercation. For a moment they seemed almost on the point of blows. Can't you bleeding well listen to what I say? I tell you no number ending in 781 for over 14 months. Yes, it has, then. No, it has not. Back home I got the whole lot of them for over two years wrote down on a piece of paper. I take some down, regular as the clock, and I tell you no number ending in seven. Yes, a seven has one. I could pretty near tell you the bleeding number. 407 it ended in. It were in February, second week in February. February, your grandmother. I got it all down in black and white. And I tell you, no number. Oh, pack it in, said the third man. They were talking about the lottery. Winston looked back when he had gone 30 meters. They were still arguing with vivid, passionate faces. The lottery, with its weekly payout of enormous prizes, was the one public event to which the proles paid serious attention. It was probable that there were some millions of proles for whom the lottery was the principal, if not the only reason, for remaining alive. It was their delight, their folly, their anodyne, their intellectual stimulant. Where the lottery was concerned, even people who could barely read and write seemed capable of intricate calculations and staggering feats of memory. There was a whole tribe of men who made a living simply by selling systems, forecasts, and lucky amulets. Winston had nothing to do with the running of the lottery, which was managed by the Ministry of Plenty. But he was aware, indeed everyone in the party was aware, that the prizes were largely imaginary. Only small sums were actually paid out, the winners of the big prizes being non-existent persons. In the absence of any real intercommunication between one part of Oceania and another, this was not difficult to arrange. But if there was hope, it lay in the proles. You had to cling on to that. When you put it in words, it sounded reasonable. It was when you looked at the human beings passing you on the pavement that it became an act of faith. The street into which he had turned ran downhill. He had a feeling that he had been in this neighborhood before and that there was a main thoroughfare not far away. 
From somewhere ahead came a din of shouting voices. The street took a sharp turn and then ended in a flight of steps which led down into a sunken alley where a few stallkeepers were selling tired-looking vegetables. At this moment Winston remembered where he was. The alley led out into the main street, and down the next turning, not five minutes away, was the junk shop where he had bought the blank book which was now his diary. And in a small stationer's shop not far away he had bought his penholder and his bottle of ink. He paused for a moment at the top of the steps. On the opposite side of the alley there was a dingy little pub, whose windows appeared to be frosted over, but in reality were merely coated with dust. A very old man, bent but active, with white moustaches that bristled forward like those of a prawn, pushed open the swing door and went in. As Winston stood watching, it occurred to him that the old man, who must be eighty at the least, had already been middle-aged when the revolution happened. He and a few others like him were the last links that now existed with the vanished world of capitalism. In the party itself, there were not many people left whose ideas had been formed before the revolution. The older generation had mostly been wiped out in the great purges of the fifties and sixties, and the few who survived had long ago been terrified into complete intellectual surrender. If there was anyone alive who could give you a truthful account of conditions in the early part of the century, it could only be a prole. Suddenly the passage from the history book that he had copied into his diary came back into Winston's mind, and a lunatic impulse took hold of him. He would go into the pub. He would scrape acquaintance with that old man and question him. He would say to him, Tell me about your life when you were a boy. What was it like in those days? Were things better than they are now, or were they worse? Hurriedly, lest he should have time to become frightened, he descended the steps and crossed the narrow street. It was madness, of course. As usual, there was no definite rule against talking to proles and frequenting their pubs, but it was far too unusual an action to pass unnoticed. If the patrols appeared, he might plead an attack of faintness, but it was not likely that they would believe him. He pushed open the door, and a hideous, cheesy smell of sour beer hit him in the face. As he entered, the din of voices dropped to about half its volume. Behind his back he could feel everyone eyeing his blue overalls. A game of darts, which was going on at the other end of the room, interrupted itself for perhaps as much as thirty seconds. The old man whom he had followed was standing at the bar having some kind of altercation with the barman, a large, stout, hook-nosed young man with enormous forearms. A knot of others standing round with glasses in their hands were watching the scene. "'I asked you civil enough, didn't I?' said the old man, straightening his shoulders pugnaciously. "'You telling me you ain't got a pint mug in the old bleeding boozer?' "'And what in hell's name is a pint?' said the barman, leaning forward with the tips of his fingers on the counter. Look at him! Calls himself a barman and don't know what a pint is. Why, a pint's the half of a quart, and there's four quarts to the gallon. Have to teach you the ABC next. Never heard of him, said the barman shortly. Liter and half liter, that's all we serve. There's the glasses on the shelf in front of you. I'd like a pint, persisted the old man. You could have drawn me off a pint easy enough. We didn't have these bleeding liters when I was a young man. When you were a young man, we were all living in the treetops, said the barman with a glance at the other customers. There was a shout of laughter, and the uneasiness caused by Winston's entry seemed to disappear. The old man's white stubbled face had flushed pink. He was turned away, muttering to himself, and bumped into Winston. Winston caught him gently by the arm. May I offer you a drink, he said. You're a gent, said the other, straightening his shoulders again. He appeared not to have noticed Winston's blue overalls. Pint, he added aggressively to the barman. Pint or wallop. The barman swished two half-liters of dark brown beer into thick glasses which he had rinsed in a bucket under the counter. Beer was the only drink you could get in prol pubs. The proles were not supposed to drink gin, though in practice they could get hold of it easily enough. The game of darts was in full swing again, and the knot of men at the bar had begun talking about lottery tickets. Winston's presence was forgotten for a moment. There was a deal table under the window where he and the old man could talk without fear of being overheard. It was horribly dangerous. But at any rate, there was no telescreen in the room, a point he had made sure of as soon as he came in. He could have drawed me off a pint, grumbled the old man as he settled down behind his glass. A half liter ain't enough. It don't satisfy, and a whole liter's too much. It starts my bladder running, let alone the price. You must have seen great changes since you were a young man, said Winston tentatively. 
The old man's pale blue eyes moved from the darts board to the bar and from the bar to the door of the gents, as though it were in the bar room that he expected the changes to have occurred. The beer was better, he said finally, and cheaper. When I was a young man, mild beer, wallop, we used to call it, was fourpence a pint. That was before the war, of course. Which war was that? said Winston. It's all wars, said the old man vaguely. He took up his glass and his shoulders straightened again. He was wishing you the very best of health. In his lean throat, the sharp-pointed Adam's apple made a surprisingly rapid up-and-down movement, and the beer vanished. Winston went to the bar and came back with two more half-liters. The old man appeared to have forgotten his prejudice against drinking a full liter. You are very much older than I am, said Winston. You must have been a grown man before I was born. You can remember what it was like in the old days before the revolution. People of my age don't really know anything about those times. We can only read about them in books, and what it says in the books may not be true. I should like your opinion on that. The history books say that life before the revolution was completely different from what it is now. There was the most terrible oppression, injustice, poverty, worse than anything we can imagine. Here in London, the great mass of the people never had enough to eat from birth to death. Half of them hadn't even boots on their feet. They worked twelve hours a day, they left school at nine, they slept ten in a room, and at the same time there were only a very few people, only a few thousands, the capitalists they were called, who were rich and powerful. They owned everything that there was to own. They lived in great gorgeous houses with thirty servants. They rode about in motor cars and four-horse carriages. They drank champagne, they wore top hats. The old man brightened suddenly. Top hats, he said. Funny you should mention them. The same thing come into my head only yesterday. I don't know why, I was just thinking I ain't seen a top hat in years. Gone right out, they have. The last time I worn one was at my sister-in-law's funeral. And that was, well, I couldn't give you the date, but it must have been fifty years ago. Of course, it was only hired for the occasion, you understand. It, it isn't very important about the top hats, said Winston patiently. The point is, these capitalists, they and a few lawyers and priests and so forth who lived on them, were the lords of the earth. Everything existed for their benefit. You, the ordinary people, the workers, were their slaves. They could do what they liked with you. They could ship you off to Canada like cattle. They could sleep with your daughters if they chose. They could order you to be flogged with something called a cat of nine tails. You had to take your cap off when you passed them. Every capitalist went about with a gang of lackeys who... The old man brightened again. Lackeys, he said. Now there's a word I ain't heard ever since so long. Lackeys. That regular takes me back, that does. I recollect, oh, donkeys years ago. I used to sometimes go to Hyde Park of a Sunday afternoon to hear the blokes making speeches. Salvation Army, Roman Catholics, Jews, Indians, all sorts there was. And there was one bloke. Well, I couldn't give you his name, but a real powerful speaker he was. He didn't half give it to him. Lackeys, he says. Lackeys of the bourgeoisie. Flunkies of the ruling class. Parasites, that was another of them. And hyenas. He definitely called them hyenas. Of course, he was referring to the Labour Party, you understand. Winston had the feeling that they were talking at cross-purposes. What I really wanted to know was this, he said. Do you feel that you have more freedom now than you had in those days? Are you treated more like a human being? In the old days, the rich people, the people at the top... The House of Lords, put in the old man reminiscently. The House of Lords, if you like. What I'm asking is... Were these people able to treat you as an inferior simply because they were rich and you were poor? Is it a fact, for instance, that you had to call them sir and take off your cap when you passed them? The old man appeared to think deeply. He drank off about a quarter of his beer before answering. Yes, he said. They liked you to touch your cap to them. It showed respect like. I didn't agree with it myself, but I'd done it often enough. Had to, as you might say. And was it usual, I'm only quoting what I've read in history books, was it usual for these people and their servants to push you off the pavement into the gutter? One of them pushed me once, said the old man. I recollect it as if it were yesterday. It was boat race night. Terrible rowdy they used to get on boat race night. And I bumps into a young bloke on Shaftesbury Avenue. Quite the gent he was, dress shirt, top hat, black overcoat. He was kind of zigzagging across the pavement, and I bumps into him accidental-like. He says, why can't you look where you're going, he says. 
I says, do you think you bought the bleeding pavement? He says, I twist your bloody head off if you get fresh with me. I says, you're drunk. I'll give you in charge in half a minute, I says. And if you'll believe me, he puts his hand on my chest and gives me a shove as pretty near sent me under the wheels of a bus. Well, I was young in them days, and I was going to have fetched him one. Only a sense of helplessness took hold of Winston. The old man's memory was nothing but a rubbish heap of details. One could question him all day without getting any real information. The party histories might still be true after a fashion. They might even be completely true. He made a last attempt. Perhaps I have not made myself clear, he said. What I'm trying to say is this. You have been alive a very long time. You lived half your life before the revolution. In 1925, for instance, you were already grown up. Would you say, from what you can remember, that life in 1925 was better than it is now or worse? If you could choose, would you prefer to live then or now? The old man looked meditatively at the darts board. He finished up his beer more slowly than before. When he spoke, it was with a tolerant, philosophic air, as though the beer had mellowed him. I know what you'd expect me to say, he said. You expect me to say as I'd sooner be young again. Most people would say they'd sooner be young if you asked them. You got your health and strength when you're young. When you get to my time of life, you ain't never well. I suffer something wicked from my feet and my bladder is just terrible. Six and seven times a night it has me out of bed. On the other hand, there's great advantages in being an old man. You ain't got the same worries. No truck with women, and that's a great thing. I ain't had a woman for near on thirty year, if you'd credit me. Nor wanted to, what's more. Winston sat back against the windowsill. It was no use going on. He was about to buy some more beer when the old man suddenly got up and shuffled rapidly into the stinking urinal at the side of the room. The extra half-liter was already working on him. Winston sat for a minute or two gazing at his empty glass and hardly noticed when his feet carried him out into the street again. Within twenty years at the most, he reflected the huge and simple question, was life better before the revolution than it is now, would have ceased once and for all to be answerable. But in effect, it was unanswerable even now, since the few scattered survivors from the ancient world were incapable of comparing one age with another. They remembered a million useless things, a quarrel with a workmate, a hunt for a lost bicycle pump, the expression on a long-dead sister's face, the swirls of dust on a windy morning seventy years ago. But all the relevant facts were outside the range of their vision. They were like the ant, which can see small objects but not large ones. And when memory failed and written records were falsified, when that happened, the claim of the party to have improved the conditions of human life had got to be accepted, because there did not exist, and never again could exist, any standard against which it could be tested. At this moment his train of thought stopped abruptly. He halted and looked up. It was in a narrow street with a few dark little shops interspersed among dwelling houses. Immediately above his head there hung three discolored metal balls, which looked as if they had once been gilded. He seemed to know the place. Of course, he was standing outside the junk shop where he had bought the diary. A twinge of fear went through him. It had been a sufficiently rash act to buy the book in the beginning, and he had sworn never to come near the place again. And yet the instant that he allowed his thoughts to wander, his feet had brought him back here of their own accord. It was precisely against suicidal impulses of this kind that he had hoped to guard himself by opening the diary. At the same time, he noticed that although it was nearly twenty-one hours, the shop was still open. With the feeling that he would be less conspicuous inside than hanging about on the pavement, he stepped through the doorway. If questioned, he could plausibly say that he was trying to buy razor blades. This ends side two of cassette two. Please stop the tape before fast forwarding to the end and loading cassette three. The proprietor had just lighted a hanging oil lamp which gave off an unclean but friendly smell. He was a man of perhaps sixty, frail and bowed with a long benevolent nose and mild eyes distorted by thick spectacles. His hair was almost white, but his eyebrows were bushy and still black. 
his spectacles, his gentle, fussy movements, and the fact that he was wearing an aged jacket of black velvet gave him a vague air of intellectuality, as though he had been some kind of literary man, or perhaps a musician. His voice was soft, as though faded, and his accent less debased than that of the majority of proles. "'I recognized you on the pavement,' he said immediately. "'You're the gentleman that bought the young lady's keepsake album. That was a beautiful bit of paper, that was.' Cream laid, it used to be called. There's been no paper like that made for, oh, I dare say, fifty years. He peered at Winston over the top of his spectacles. Is there anything special I can do for you, or did you just want to look around? I was passing, said Winston vaguely. I just looked in. I don't want anything in particular. It's just as well, said the other, because I don't suppose I could have satisfied you. He made an apologetic gesture with his soft-palmed hand. You see how it is. An empty shop, you might say. Between you and me, the antique trade's just about finished. No demand any longer, and no stock either. Furniture, china, glass, it's all been broken up by degrees. And, of course, the metal stuff's mostly been melted down. I haven't seen a brass candlestick in years. The tiny interior of the shop was in fact uncomfortably full, but there was almost nothing in it of the slightest value. The floor space was very restricted, because all round the walls were stacked innumerable dusty picture frames. In the window there were trays of nuts and bolts, worn-out chisels, penknives with broken blades, tarnished watches that did not even pretend to be in going order, and other miscellaneous rubbish. Only on a small table in the corner was there a litter of odds and ends, lacquered snuff-boxes, agate brooches, and the like, which looked as though they might include something interesting. As Winston wandered toward the table, his eye was caught by a round, smooth thing that gleamed softly in the lamplight, and he picked it up. It was a heavy lump of glass, curved on one side, flat on the other, making almost a hemisphere. There was a peculiar softness, as of rainwater, in both the color and the texture of the glass. At the heart of it, magnified by the curved surface, there was a strange, pink, convoluted object that recalled a rose or a sea anemone. What is it? said Winston, fascinated. That's coral, that is, said the old man. It must have come from the Indian Ocean. They used to kind of embed it in the glass. That wasn't made less than a hundred years ago, more by the look of it. It's a beautiful thing, said Winston. It is a beautiful thing, said the other appreciatively, but there's not many that'd say so nowadays. He coughed. Now, if it so happened that you wanted to buy it, sir, that had cost you four dollars. I can remember when a thing like that would have fetched eight pounds. And eight pounds was... Well, I can't work it out, but it was a lot of money. But who cares about genuine antiques nowadays, even the few that's left? Winston immediately paid over the four dollars and slid the coveted thing into his pocket. What appealed to him about it was not so much its beauty as the air it seemed to possess of belonging to an age quite different from the present one. The soft, rain-watery glass was not like any glass that he had ever seen. The thing was doubly attractive because of its apparent uselessness, though he could guess that it must once have been intended as a paperweight. It was very heavy in his pocket, but fortunately it did not make much of a bulge. It was a queer thing, even a compromising thing, for a party member to have in his possession. Anything old, and for that matter anything beautiful, was always vaguely suspect. The old man had grown noticeably more cheerful after receiving the four dollars. Winston realized that he would have accepted three or even two. There's another room upstairs that you might care to take a look at, he said. There's not much in it, just a few pieces. Uh, we'll do with a light if we're going upstairs. He lit another lamp and with bowed back led the way slowly up the steep and worn stairs and along a tiny passage into a room which did not give on the street but looked out on a cobbled yard and a forest of chimney-pots. Winston noticed that the furniture was still arranged as though the room were meant to be lived in. There was a strip of carpet on the floor, a picture or two on the walls, and a deep, slatternly armchair drawn up to the fireplace. An old-fashioned glass clock with a twelve-hour face was ticking away on the mantelpiece. Under the window and occupying nearly a quarter of the room was an enormous bed with a mattress still on it. "'We lived here till my wife died,' said the old man, half apologetically. "'I'm selling the furniture off by little and little. "'Now, that's a beautiful mahogany bed. "'Or at least it would be if you could get the bugs out of it. 
But I dare say you'd find it a little bit cumbersome. He was holding the lamp high up so as to illumine the whole room, and in the warm, dim light the place looked curiously inviting. The thought flitted through Winston's mind that it would probably be quite easy to rent the room for a few dollars a week, if he dared to take the risk. It was a wild, impossible notion to be abandoned as soon as thought of, but the room had awakened in him a sort of nostalgia, a sort of ancestral memory. It seemed to him that he knew exactly what it felt like to sit in a room like this, in an armchair beside an open fire with your feet in the fender and a kettle on the hob, utterly alone, utterly secure, with nobody watching you, no voice pursuing you, no sound except the singing of the kettle and the friendly ticking of the clock. There's no telescreen, he could not help murmuring. Ah, said the old man, I never had one of those things. Too expensive. And I never seem to feel the need of it somehow. Now, that's a nice gate-leg table in the corner there. Though, of course, you'd have to put new hinges on it if you wanted to use the flaps. There was a small bookcase in the other corner, and Winston had already gravitated toward it. It contained nothing but rubbish. The hunting down and destruction of books had been done with the same thoroughness in the prole quarters as everywhere else. It was very unlikely that there existed anywhere in Oceania a copy of a book printed earlier than 1960. The old man, still carrying the lamp, was standing in front of a picture in a rosewood frame which hung on the other side of the fireplace, opposite the bed. Now, if you happen to be interested in old prints at all, he began delicately, Winston came across to examine the picture. It was a steel engraving of an oval building with rectangular windows and a small tower in front. There was a railing running round the building, and at the rear end there was what appeared to be a statue. Winston gazed at it for some moments. It seemed vaguely familiar, though he did not remember the statue. The frame's fixed to the wall, said the old man, but I could unscrew it for you, I dare say. I know that building, said Winston finally. It's a ruin now. It's in the middle of the street outside the Palace of Justice. That's right, outside the law courts. It was bombed in... Oh, many years ago, it, it was a church at one time. St. Clement's Dane, its name was. He smiled apologetically, as though conscious of saying something slightly ridiculous, and added, Oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clement's. What's that? said Winston. Oh, oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clement's. That was a rhyme we had when I was a little boy. How it goes on, I don't remember. But I do know it ended up... Uh, here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. It was a kind of dance. They held out their arms for you to pass under, and when they came to here comes a chopper to chop off your head, they brought their arms down and caught you. It was just names of churches. All the London churches were in it. All the principal ones, that is. Winston wondered vaguely to what century the church belonged. It was always difficult to determine the age of a London building. Anything large and impressive, if it was reasonably new in appearance, was automatically claimed as having been built since the Revolution, while anything that was obviously of earlier date was ascribed to some dim period called the Middle Ages. The centuries of capitalism were held to have produced nothing of any value. One could not learn history from architecture any more than one could learn it from books. Statues, inscriptions, memorial stones, the names of streets, anything that might throw light upon the past had been systematically altered. I never knew it had been a church, he said. There's a lot of them left, really, said the old man, although they've been put to other uses. Now, how did that rhyme go? Ah, oh, I've got it. Oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clement's. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. 